All right. Good evening, everybody. And thanks for joining us here and braving the uh, a little rather volatile Kansas weather this evening. Uh, and thanks to everyone joining us online as well. I should stoop so they can see me, I suppose. I'm Will Haynes of the Watkins Museum, and I appreciate you coming out and joining us tonight. And again, welcome to everyone joining us from home. Um, we welcome you here for what promises to be one of the more unusual uh, events we've done, and I'm sure a very uh, interesting story that we're about to hear. Now with that, I would like to turn it over to Lori Vancina, Watkins board member and um, director of the Max Cotta Center for German American Studies for a little introduction. As I bear with me as I try to elegantly angle the laptop toward Lori over here. So I apologize for any motion sickness among the people at home. And if I don't speak loudly enough, let me know and I'll speak up. Thank you for your introduction, Will. It's great to be back for an in-person event at the beautiful Watkins Museum of History in downtown Lawrence, the favorite long-standing partner of the KU Max Cotta Center in the Department of German, Amer German Studies. Thank you too for all you've done to organize and promote this event with our prize-winning Austrian novelist, Stefan Griebel, who uses the pseudonym Franz Sobel. Most of what I learned, most of what I know about Lawrence history, I learned from the exhibits and programming at this museum, but it was great to hear from Franz Sobel some weeks ago and learn something new and rather strange about our history. And since then, I've been asking everyone, hey, did you know about Einstein's brain? And many people did. I'm looking forward to learning more about the piece of Einstein's brain that resided here in Lawrence. I'm especially interested in finding out how Franz Obel discovered this story and knowing how successful a Watkins and its, its partners have been in sharing and making accessible the history of Douglas County. I'm sure all who are here tonight or watching the live stream want to learn more about the novel our esteemed guest is writing about this piece, literally, of Lawrence history. Before traveling to Lawrence, Franz Obel presented a reading at the Austrian Cultural Forum in New York. We're honored to have you here in Lawrence. Franz Obel studied not only German philosophy and history in Vienna, but also painting and conceptual art. He's written many novels, poems, plays, radio plays, and children's books. And his many prizes include the Arthur Schnitzler Prize and the Nestroy Theater Prize. In 2017, his Das Floss der Medusa, The Raft of the Medusa, was on the shortlist for the German Book Prize, and it won the Bavarian Book Prize. Quoting from the website New Books in German, The Raft of the Medusa, focuses on how the captain of the Argus discovers a raft some 20 meters long off the coast of East Africa, West Coast of Africa. Quoting from this website, the emaciated figures are the last 15 of 147 people who survived for two weeks on the open seas after the shipwreck of the frigate Medusa. They had simply been abandoned since there wasn't any enough room on the lifeboats. Told from the view of the scullion Victor, the book recounts how this tragedy could come to pass. The website New German Literature refers to Franz Obel as one of Austria's most popular and polarizing writers. He has received numerous awards, including the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize in 1995, the Arthur Schnitzer Prize. Schnitzer's stories have been described as the amoral voice of late 19th century Vienna. His first works were self-published but became known to wider audiences when he was awarded the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize in 1995. 
He studied German studies and history in Vienna while studying painting and conceptual art intensively, he made his first attempts as a, as a visual artist. Among the many literary awards are the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize, given in memory of Ingeborg Bachmann, one of the most distinguished Austrian writers. And he also received the Kassel Literary Prize, established in 1885, an annual prize awarded by the city of Kassel and the Bruckner Kuhner Foundation in recognition of grotesque and comic work at a high artistic level. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thanks, Lori, for the great introduction. And uh, thanks for the, to the Watkins Museum for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here because it's an interesting place. I'm writing on this novel at the, at the moment. I'm not yet finished, but I'm near to the finish. Uh, I signed today the contract with the publisher house. And <laughs> in next January, it will be published. And I was, I have to apologize, my English is a little bit bumpy. I'm not used to speak English normally, but I hope you will understand me. But don't be too strict with my pronunciation. Maybe sometimes it sounds a little bit like pitching English or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, normally I'm fighting with German. German is a very complicated language. I'm, I'm fighting the whole day. And so uh, in English is a, is a foreign territorium for me. But <laughs> you will understand, hopefully. Uh, I heard from this story of Einstein's brain three years ago, the first time, and I was absolutely fascinated uh, because I was I'm interested in, in modern physics. I visited, uh, I guess, 10, 15 years ago, the, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. You know this? It's a, circling about 15 kilometers, I guess, and there uh, let collides uh, particulars. And, and there they found, for instance, that the Higgs blossom, which was the, uh, the evidence for the, for the standard model, we call it in German, uh, like the basic of physics. I don't understand all this physics stuff, <laughs> but for me, it's a, I think it's a, there are so many philosophy inclusions in, in this that we can think about it, uh, to think that there's no constant time, no constant space. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing. No no time, no space. We, so Big Bang, the word is wrong because there was no bang. It was no space for making a bang. It was nothing. <laughs> Just a very small particle. And so, this, uh, this story gives me the, the possibility to, to think about physics. Uh, it's the, the story of this uh, Thomas Harvey, who worked as a pathologist in, in the Princeton Hospital in New Jersey. And he made, uh, on the 18th of April in 1955, Einstein died. He made the autopsy. Um, maybe five hours later, and uh, he, he he noticed that the reason of Einstein's death it was a exploited aorta that the big vein there exploited, uh, and it took not too much time. And then Harvey decided, okay, he wants to to see Einstein's brain. He wants wants to find where is the genius uh, on this brain. He had not the education to find anything. <laughs> <laughs> but he puts the, the brain out and says to everybody, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for this genius. And he never gave this brain away. Uh, and I, I think for 42 years. Uh, and he started as a you know, well, well common pathologist with a nice house in Princeton. And 40 years later, he lived here in Lawrence worked in a plastic factory uh, called E&E, &E. maybe you know it, <laughs> uh, like a 
common worker. He took the, the plastic granulates in an extruder. It was a very strong work. And he worked from, with 80, he was 80 or 82, uh, from four in the afternoon to midnight every day. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's the, the basic of the story. He had two or three divorces, this Thomas Harvey. And for me, it wasn't enough to to uh, to tell only this story. In my in my novel, the brain starts to speak with Harvey <laughs> after like, eighty pages. <laughs> uh, and and Harvey was a, a Quaker, uh, a big believer. And for me, it's a question how we can put religion and this. Um, new things on physics together. Is it possible or is it not possible? And, and Harvey tries to, to bring a salvation to this brain, uh, to Einstein, to let him go. And he tries a lot of different religions. First, he is uh, with Jewish guys, and the Jewish think it's a deep book, uh, 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 a not so fine ghost. And we, we make to have a, a this kind of exorcism with it doesn't work. Uh, and then he was with Christians and he was with Indians. The Indians made a collective suicide with, with the brain and with Harvey, it didn't work. And then, then he also tried the Islam and a lot of other, other system of, of uh, people are believing it. Not only religion, all, all, also a lot of other uh, possibilities. And so I, I read some excerpts now. Uh, the book is not yet, but I have a translation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Austrian Cultural, Cultural Forum did it, and Ross Benjamin made the translation. Thomas Stolz Harvey was my man's name. Eyes gray, wolf eyes, thin lips. He started a bit, never blinked, often laughed for no reason and was afraid of horses, also he had never ridden. They called him the silent man or the white rabbit. White rabbit because there was a, a movie with James Stewart, my friend Harvey, and he had this white rabbit and so they called him also white rabbit. Somewhat taller than average, chiseled face, high hairline, non not unattractive. Thomas Stolz Harvey was the man's name. This is the story of a shipwreck without a ship, a stranding without a shore, and a sinking without water. You've never heard of this castaway? Also, it did exist. Thomas Harvey wasn't smashed against the coastal cliffs, but against a soft gray mass, a brain. <laughs> against a sinking organ that for 76 years was inside the head of physicist Albert Einstein incubating thoughts like the theory of general relativity, the brain sank Thomas Harvey. Because of this lump of protein, he lost his mind, but also found wisdom, love, faith, and finally himself. Thomas Harvey was the man's name. Thomas Harvey was my man's name. Thomas Harvey's story involves physics and religion. I don't know much about former, since my mathematical knowledge is limited to arithmetic. But as far as religion is concerned, there's no question that people no longer believe. By which I don't mean that they mock martyrs who have been skinned, roasted or quaffed. The catastrophe isn't that they've declared God dead, but that they've lost faith. They no longer think of God. They believe only in themselves and with esotericism, Asian culinary philosophy and astrology, they conquered something for themselves that makes the world real. Some profess their devotion to Real Madrid, others to string theory, still others worship the stock market in index, Kurt Cobain, Cobain abstract painting, nuclear fusion or fusion cuisine, but this is a false piety. The believer is happier even if he believes humbug. 
faith provides strength and confidence. But we are living in a time of doubt, the time of confusion. The idea of God gave the universe meaning. Now we have fragmentation. Everything religious is open to attack. It's vulgarly robbed and ridiculed. What would people today do if they went to heaven? Take a selfie to share to the soul. <laughs> it's sad, but that's just the way people are. Since art and literature are meant to celebrate the simple man, this story is about an ordinary fellow, a believer or a religious man whom an angel... Ah, uh, stop, I don't want to give too much away. This angel is the storyteller, but the angel starts as a member of the... the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be buffed off by the fact that back when this story began in the mid 50s of the last century, I was working for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> Today, I'm no longer interested in such truths or arguments about right or wrong. Uh, but you can take it from me that for human beings, unbelief is the same catastrophe as impact of a comet for the dinosaurs. Because one thing is certain, we will be believers or not be at all. But as long as there is gra gravity, as long as things are homesick for their origin, I'm not without hope. Thomas Harvey was the name of the man who stole Albert's, Albert Einstein's brain, a brain that at the same point began to speak. Albert Einstein was an old mustached man with specs under his eyes and a good-natured puppy dog look around whom a crazy cult of personality was built up. He had fled the world from the enormous belief in Newtonian gravitation and proclaimed a salvation that no one understood. He recognized only one God, the speed of light, only one gospel, the curvature of space-time, and the whole world ran after his, this new messiah, worshipped him. Among the doctors and nurses, words had spread about who was on the table in the autopsy room. Again and again, some slipped into cage a glimpse of the genius. It occurred to more than one of them to cut off a lock of the renowned man's hair. And once, once something like that's gay, that gets going. When the crematorium stuff arrived, towered one o'clock in the afternoon, Einstein's practically had a bus cut. <laughs> a surgeon had come up with the idea of breaking out one of the physics teeth. Even the man who lifted the corpse into the zinc coffin didn't want to let this opportunity pass, pass them by. The bodies being inc incinerated anyhow. It was like the heyday of the relic trade. Everyone wanted a souvenir, <laughs> a piece of evidence of the genius. Einstein would turn over in his grave if he had one. <laughs> this sort of cannibalism had always been abhorrent to him. There was only also a doctor who put the eyes of Einstein, and there is the story that maybe Michael Jackson bought his eyes <laughs> for $5 million. I'm not sure if it's right. At 4.30, 16 hours after his death, Einstein's mortal remains were incinerated in the evening cemetery crematorium in Trenton. The relatives wanted the matter settled quickly. The castaways alone in the middle of an endless expanse, surrounded by nothing but horizon. From above, the sun is beating down on him. From below, threatened the depths, depths. He clings to anything he can grab hold for on, hold off. For Harvey, it was the Quakers. Following his spontaneous inspiration, he took the brain with him to a service of the Society of Friends, not to feel the light of knowledge, but to come to rest. He greeted the Ehrlichs, Sally and Aline, nodded to the others and sat down on one of the plain chairs in a spartanly 
furnished meeting hall. There were no pictures hanging on the walls, the curtains were stayed, and the chandelier, as a matter of fact, as a building block. As all religious gatherings, the atmosphere was completely asexual and less exciting than a tupperware party. <laughs> No one paid attention to the brain. Some thought that Harvey had brought a piece of his work. Others that there were poor serfs in the container. Harvey set the jar beside him and closed his eyes as he had done hundreds of times before. No one spoke, all striving inwardly to experience enlightenment. The pathologist suppressed cuffs, sort of great here. Uh, he loves her, of her jaguar eyes, called himself to order, had deep exhalations from his fellow believers, is someone snoring, commanded his thoughts to turn toward miracles of fate, opening and letting go. He tried not to think, but it was impossible. He felt like Dostoevsky's younger brother, after the writer had commanded him not to think of purple ball bearers or was it pink polar bears? Try not to think of the words Maghreb and microbe for 30 seconds. You wouldn't succeed. <laughs> Dear God, I thank you for my life, for the fact that my family is healthy, yet great thing couldn't be driven away with this. She was his pink polar bear, his Maghreb microbe. What had she said? Too bad there's no light in, in the digestive tract, so the workers down there can't even see the colorful vegetables. Harvey's inner voice murmured terms like deep trust and unconditional love, from which he expected solid ground under his feet. Microbe, magre, purple, ball beers, great and colorful vegetables. Ever since half the world was cheesing him because of this brain. He drifted around unmoved. Now it was hard for him to think about love, God, and nothing. Suddenly he heard a voice, Ist da etwas? Swiss German for, is there something there? What? Was God speaking to him? A worker in his stomach? Considering everything that had happened, this was too strange. And Harvey put it out of his mind, but then opening his eyes and seeing a light flaring up, he felt as if he were having an attack of hearing loss. Then the voice rang out again. Is there etwas? Is there nüni? Könnt ich eine Käfflipstelle? Is there something there? Is it nine yet? Can I order coffee yet? He saw Sally and Aline ehrlich, sunken in their chairs and smiling contentedly. They retired, they retired janitor, two widows, a secretary, the second-hand dealer and others he hardly knew, all were melting in the spiritual sensibilities. They could have been sopped up with bread. Again, the voice rang out. Any hütscher city gläser? Das got, das got mo. Wo wäre denn der Ruf bewahrt? Have I read the, have I read the paper, the paper yet today? I missed that. Where I'm being kept here? How he knew he wo it wasn't. God who was speaking, or was God Swiss, nor, <laughs> nor a worker in his stomach, but the brain. Yes, indeed. Harvey had never heard Swiss German before and understood barely anything. And yet it was clear to him where the words were coming from. The brain wasn't really speaking, but he heard the voice distinctly. His face went rigid and lost all color, astonishing. All that one hears in the darkness of a mind, was he overworked or was he losing his sanity? The medical practitioner knew that people who were under great stress occasionally had hallucinations, but the voice was distinct, not as clear as a newscaster, rather it sounded hollow as if, if, as if it were coming through a pipe at the sea lion pitch, he felt as if, 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 as if his head were made of nothing but biscuits, socked in alcohol, now breaking apart. 
I may mention this. He told himself, drawing out the space between the words, everything that probable is probably false, comes from the scant, the cut. How could this brain in the jar be talking to me? Ridiculous. Then he started to, to bring him salvation and maybe 200 pages later, uh, he came to the to Islam. Al-Eladolid, fruit and vegetables, read the sign over the story. Harvey set the brain jar on the counter and the green grocer looked at him perplexed. Homemade kimchi? <laughs> You'll have to take it to a Chinese place. I carried some Russian picky beds. Picky beds. Beats beds. Didn't sell. Not in America, where beds have to be star shaped and striped. Since Harvey said nothing in reply, the green grocers became pressure. You know, understand? You in wrong place. Must go to the yellow face. Understand? Jinx. The brain of Albert Einstein. Interesting name, but won't sell. Yeah. <laughs> the green grocer wore a brown bonus, plastic slippers, and a sort of teacup warmer on his head. His name was Heike, and he offered Harvey tea. Or would you prefer beer? I thought Arabs don't drink. I'm Syrian, but that's the same here. The Oriental chewed peanuts and grinned. Some drink, some don't. So, uh, what do you want with Einstein's prime? Go to a Chinese place. They eat anything that promises <laughs> potency. <laughs> it speaks. I know it sounds unbelievable, but sometimes it talks to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Heike raised an eyebrow, and what does it say? First and foremost, it doesn't believe in God. This big lens of chi tissue are atheist. I want to bring them salvation. Now I'm doing the rounds of all the world religions and my wife thinks I should give Islam a try. Then you have to go to the mosque and talk to the imam. I'm a green grocer. The scholars wouldn't, would love to me. But someone who lives the religion, someone like you, the brain believes in no God, only in formulas and physics. Heike said that he was no expert in Islam. He did own a Koran, but this book was modeled, arranged according to length. Imagine organizing the works of Shakespeare according to the length of the sentences. What sense would that make? Besides, said Heike, he couldn't read well and everything he knew about it was terrible. Only prohibitions. The Oriental flashed a smile dominated by the gap between his teeth. I've seen you pray. Harvey sipped the bitter tasting tea. Tell me what your religion is like. He looked at the brain, hoping Heike would impress it. Religion, in my line of work, you have to get up early and make sure nothing rots. That must be something like how God does it with people. How, however, has started rotting goes to the back. The good into the pot, the bad into the crop. And, and if the customer isn't careful, it's part off on it. Those who are unlucky end up at the compost heap. Prayers are the fertilizers and sins like pests. From the vegetable point of view, it's clear who gets into the garden of God, which then is a salad. We Muslims believe in Jesus too, said the green grocer. But for us, he's a prophet whom God gave ma magical abilities. There is only one God who made the vault of heaven, stretched out seven heavens and sold up all the vegetable to create such things requires time. Only God guides us to the, to the truth. What is the truth? The truth is the accounting at the end of the month. God and maybe even the court. If you can't pay the rent at the end, the truth is clear. God gave us life, women and vegetables. Where is my, where is my, my holy book anyway? Heike stood up and 
remanched in the drone of his counter, pulling out account beds, car catalogs and papers, most likely from the time of the Asian Egyptians, no quarrel. Then a porn magazine fell on the floor, Harvey pretended he hadn't seen mm -hmm. it. God is master of all things. He knows the most secret corners of our hearts and everything is recorded in his cash book. He knows that we take pleasure in things like this. He held up the porn magazine. The West invented this so that there wouldn't be a decline of the birth rate. But we are, were, where my Quran is, God doesn't know. Heidi handed Harvey a plate of pistachio and almond pastries. God hears and sees everything, and to him all things return. He gives our lives meaning. The Oriental walked over to the jar and tapped it with his knuckle. Salam alaikum, Mr. Einstein. Do you want to convert like Jesus Clay? <laughs> if you ask me, there's no difference between Jewish, Jewish Christians, Muslims, all circ circumcised. Circumcised <laughs> in memory of the sacrifice of Abraham, who snipped off the hood of his willy when he was 100 <laughs> years old. No, for hygienic reasons, because otherwise the foreskin will get infected, at least if you live in the desert. What does your paradise look like? There are wine and honey flow. Plus, there are huris. And everyone praises and exalts God. Isn't that boring? God is strict. There's no God but him, and we are supposed to fear him. Eno, an, uh, agonizing punishments await the unbelievers. God will never forgive them for not honoring him enough or for ignoring him altogether. So he's illogical, vindictive, and unmerciful. He demands respect, like Muhammad Ali. Isn't that understandable? He made the stars so that we can see the dark. He is the one who created us. He disdains unbelievers who love life more than him. There is no one like him. Allah begets not, nor is he begotten. But boring? No, God acts. If I've cursed and missed the prayer, he says, all right, you will go to paradise. But for you, there are only 14 virgins. Ridiculous, I reply. I've done the Hajj, always fasting during the Ramadan. What's your offer? 18 at the most. Do you want to insult me? 18 is the cost of the prayers. I've ripped <coughs> off Christians. Shall we say 30, 24? Is that your final word? word? It goes on like this for all eternity. <laughs> is it true that you believe in angels? Angels are everywhere. There are good ones and bad ones, just like people. Jinn are beings, made, are beings made of smokeless fire, those beings that populated the earth before us. Then God created the first man from clay and praised life into him. There's no, no, not much more I can say. We have faced fasting commandments and women are supposed to feed themselves Islam is a tolerant religion, only the Jews. You shall not boil a young goat into a mother's milk and hence all the dietary rules, two refrigerators or better yet, two kitchens, we are tolerant. But what the Jews perform, they are almost as bonkers as the Hindus with their cows. I'm really tolerant, but cattle worship goes too far. <laughs> and what about alcohol? Not before prayer. Heike laughed. Have you ever sat, sat on a rocky beach and listened to the rolling sound? There are millions of round stones, but not a single one forms a perfect sphere. Not a single one. It's exactly the same with human beings. God knows that no one is without flaws. You know, Islam makes me feel that I'm not alone. The daily praying and washing, rinsing the mouth three times, cleaning the nose three times, the face, the ears, everything three times. And as the green grocer spoke like this, a great fatigue came over Harvey. His eyelids were suddenly leaden. 
He felt a war warm wind brushing his cheek, cheeks and silence creeping under his skin. Darkness swallowed everything. Soon there was neither clarity nor context. When he opened his eyes again, he was sitting amid saffron tunes. Not a landscape, but a promise of peace and infinity. Wherever he looked, he looked, he saw nothing but sand, sand and more sand, as if he had shrunk and ended up in his wife's powder compact. How he didn't feel panic, however, but deep inner tranquility. Was he in the middle of nowhere or in the center of the world? Where is Highgate? Where's the brain? The white rabbit took off his shoes and stepped barefoot into the warm sand. It didn't him it did him good to feel his feet, the little grains between his toes. He woke up the dunes deeper than he thought. And on the other side he saw an oasis with palm trees. God, is that beautiful? Out of nowhere, a person wrapped in blue clothes appeared, handed Harvey dates and milk. Dates? Sweet sushi rolls. Alhamdulillah. You can't clap with one hand. The Tuareg smiled and pointed off the glass. Camel milk. As Harvey drank, he comparated why all the world's religion had arisen in the desert. Here people understood each other without words, had no dreams because everything was absurd. Here you didn't need a new car or a bigger house. Instead, you had the sky and the stars close enough to pluck the cosmos in all its glory. Here you had empire and you felt God. The desert was the land of the homeless, God's land. Do the people here have as many words for sand as the Inuit have for snow? Sand after the rain, sand through which a caravan has passed, sand after the midday sun, no, said the Tuareg, but we have many terms for the wind. In the West, they have the most words for money. Duff, clams, mula, lut, the blue man laughed and, and here for wind. Harvey now saw bug-eyed dromedaries, their faces distorted as if they threw a wide angel lens. What strange animals. Big nose trees, thick lips, not particularly graceful. A bowl of couscous was brought, pieces of meat and vegetables lay on, on it like gems on a velvet pillows. Cloaked men began to clap and sing. Bismala was the only thing Harvey understood. One of them set, set, sets the beat by banging stones together. Then there was a small drum and a plucked instrument, Bismala. It was trance like music that led on involuntarily to the end of all sorts. Traditionally, said the Tuareg, we sit on the ground, eat with our hands, all from one bowl. Traditionally, the animal is ritually slaughtered because then all evil goes out of it. Traditionally, the women are weaned. Guests never get to see them. The Tuareg took a bone, a bush, and sucked out marrow. There was smoked eggplant, camel meat, intense as corned beef, and a sauce with pomegranate seeds. Then the wind drinker served Arab Arabic whiskey tea. The first for talking, the second for listening, listening the third for deciding. The mustard colored sand was Soothing also the dunes wandered and there were shredded car tires lying everywhere like snakeskins. Harvey felt that the sky was <coughs> unfathomable, but it protected from what lay behind, the infinite. He gazed into the clear starry night and it was as if the sky were holding its breath, as if it all time had Congeed as if there, if he had the journey to his true self or to God were at his destination. The next moment, a pickup truck roared through the dunes, making horrible noise. No, it was hiking. 
Maybe God isn't right for you, Einstein. Maybe he'd rather be at the Asian place as kimchi. Harvey opened his eyes and <coughs> saw he was back at the green grocers. And what do you what do you recommend? I'd let him watch TV, nature shows, pretty women, but Islam <coughs> that's just causes misunderstandings. You know, in our cultural sphere, you wash yourself after number two. Hence, we have a water hose in the bathrooms. Now, when Iraqis, Syrians, or Egyptians enter a Western bathroom, they see the toilet, but no hose, and think what dirty pigs these Westerns are. Then they look around, see the hose in the shower, draw their conclusions, and the mess is complete. complete. <laughs> Cultural misunderstandings. Thank you. Harvey stood up and held up his hands to the green grocers, but immediately withdrew. withdrew it. I don't know whether it impressed Einstein, but I like it, especially the desert. God is great in all his forms and such a small human brain has nothing to oppose to him. However, many formulas I can think up. Only imperfection is perfect. Is perfect. The green grocer grinned and bit into an apple. Uh, 100 pages later, <coughs> the Navajo have 60 ways of pronouncing the word cloud. And the Eskimos know a hundred expressions for snow. But you'll find the church of the present only in Manhattan. Burroughs stepped on the great Buick and said that the radio was now fixed. Without, without it, we couldn't drive to New York, to the church of the present. Harvey fetched the brain and Malky struggled, Malky was the third wife of Harvey, Malky struggled with a travel bag. We could do without cyber problems now. A short time later, hang on Sloopy sounded from the speakers. <laughs> the three <laughs> The three of them sitting in the limo, singing, the brain between Harvey's feet, hang on, Sloopy, Sloopy. <laughs> I always thought of Snoopy from the Peanuts. Burroughs confessed that it had been a while since he had last driven himself. His hands were shaking and he was going too fast, but eventually, having heard everything from Pink Floyd to kind of Heat, they reached their destination, Greenwich Village. It was 99 degrees, the asphalt was boiling, and Harvey feared the brain might get a heat stroke. Hang on, Sloopy, Sloopy, hang on. <coughs> Otto Nathan, the executor of Einstein's testamentary, lived not far, not far from here. They didn't visit him or it's his apartment, however, but they went to a gallery. The hippest, hippest gallery were large sculptures made of hay, hay, hay. Bales, no, seagrass, were on display. The exhibition was titled All Assholes Except Mom. <laughs> there were back clayed ladies with beehives and dangling silver earrings, old, bald men in dark suit, and freaks in sunglasses. Burroughs was embraced by everyone and addressed as maestro, as true, a true poet. Don't you know it? The older writers might, Tom Bates, Laurie Anderson, David Byrne, and other celebrities, celebrities, celebrities of whom Harvey had never heard were standing around bored. Harvey felt somewhat uncomfortable in his plaid shirt. He looked like a woodworker. Just then a decked out lady approached him. I recognized you. She poured her index finger into his chest. It would be pointless to deny it. Admit it. It's you. Harvey didn't know what she meant. Thomas, the lady whispered, confess it's you. How do, how, do you, do, how do you know my name? It's you, the lady clapped enthusiastically. I knew it. I don't know what you're talking about. You rascal. Now the lady wagged her index finger. I love your books, even if you sometimes overdo it. She pointed at Harvey and shouted, It's him! 
provide open mouth for the name Thomas Pynchon. Mauki had put on an I'm about to lose it smile and whispered, what are we doing here? Nothing but snobs. Harvey <laughs> shrugged. He grabbed, he grabbed a glass of wine and listened to people conversing about the artwork. To him, they were cut to size hay bales of a sort that were set up in front of a village fair in the Midwest. The visitor spoke of expanding the concept of the plastic arts, sculpt, sculpt, social sculpture, transcendence. A gray-haired lady in a simple but expensive designer dress was close to a cousin as she raved about the fine textures of the sea grasses. Reminis sense of impressionism, Monet's water lilies. The things remind me to a mixture of dung and what comes out of a shredder. So Harvey. The lady, however, saw in them a symbol of transcendence. Indeed, she seemed to have had countless failed cosmetic surgeries, and also her cheeks were as plump as freshly picked up. Pick, picked up. Her thin white neck could not deny her true age. When a grey mop top appeared, a bus went through the crowd, attending the opening. Andy murmured the voices, a gaunt man dressed all in black, cast in fleeting, glanced at the sculptures, greeted a few people and disappeared again. The ghost of Andy Warhol, the gentleman said, stunned, a crazy actor explained the lady. A gentleman in dark horned, rimmed glasses, suit, sandals, no socks, struck his glass with a knife. As soon he was certain, of undivided attention, he began to speech, a speech. To Harvey, it was as if the man were speaking in Gaetian Babylonian. Wonderful, whispered the lady behind him. There's no better art theorist than this letterer. I don't understand a word, a word, a word of that this loiterer says, said the companion, but I love him. Terms like dirty, contextualism, magnet, this Cosivity, anarchistic environment were deployed just as Randy Lederer was about to equate the seagrass hay bales with Van Gogh and elevate them to the level of Rembrandt, a huge dog whose ancestors had hunted bees in Georgia, broke loose, loose and began smacking and slobbering all over the art theorist's exposed to toes. This compulsive person who didn't realize that his body too produced vapors was torn between Ansha and Lafa. To lose what wreck a lady with a thick pearl necklace and a fish in her, eye, her hair. Yes, she was actually wearing a clit head bream with his, its mouth open on her head, gelled. No, gel is the wrong word. It was the sharp tone of a queen, the queen of hearts, when she hissed off with his head. Harvey knew instinctively that it had to be the gallerist. Meanwhile, the animal was licking as if proceed at the spaces between letters tools, while the art theorists drove to remain serious. A slobbering, slurping sound filled the room. This is fragmentary. One visitor was delighted. A fractal, a social sculpture, another agreed. This is true deconstruction. Toulouse Lautrec, how dare you? At that moment, the monster turned around, lunged towards a wheelchair bound woman and began to mate with her knee. <laughs> a short Mexican man sized the animal and tried to pull it away, actually managing to move it toward the exit suddenly. The dog stopped, raised a leg, and with the indifferent face of a cow being milked, marked one of the sculptures. <laughs> no, to lose the track, no! <laughs> well, how do you like it? Burroughs had broken away from his admirers and had swagging gait of a sailor who had been on a ship for months. The good man was plastered. <laughs> 
we don't understand what we are doing here, how he had stuck the drain under his arm and uh, was stifling at John. That's right, Moki confirmed. We feel like big in a Hawaiian luau. We're just waiting for them to stick apples in our mouths and roast us. Church, said Burroughs. The art business is the church of the present. Look at the ladies. They resemble sanctimonious worshippers, only more luxurious. The curators and critics are the priests, galleries and museums are like temples. And God, asked Marky, art. Art gives things meaning. It is God. Burroughs beamed and how I knew that this was the wrong goal for Einstein. He was about to persuade his companions to leave when someone tipped him, tapped him on the, shoulder, on the shoulder. Well, how do you like the works, Mr. Pinchel? The gallerist and a nondescript little man had planted themselves in front of him. Pinchel, Burroughs smiled to himself. I really must introduce you to the artist. He loves your books, the gallerist beamed, and the little man smiled sheepishly. Uh, may I ask you a question? How we add the scrawny man into the jaggered suit? Go ahead. The pale artist reached for a cigarette. I don't know much about art. It's true, but always would have thought that if you devote your life to it, how we falter it. Well, I would have thought that then there would have be a soul in the works too, heart's blood. I beg your pardon, the artist smiled sheepishly toward the gallerist. I'm the most important artist of our time. You can read about me in the art magazine. The most important and the most expensive art at the gallerist. Even Peggy Guggenheim has a test to me style. There's no question that my work has social le relevance. Social relevance, social relevance, <coughs> these clumps of seagrass, and you come along, along with such profound terms as soul and heart's blood. What time are you living in? Did you slept through pop art and postmodernism? <coughs> By the way, your books are boring hogwash. <laughs> it's more exciting to watch paint dry. But I just wanted to, Harvey stammered, I would have been interested <coughs> to know what your concerns are, what you are trying to express. Did you hear that? The artist now seems six feet tall. This little head writer <coughs> is knocking me. I didn't think you associated with, su with, with such peasants, the gallerist said to Burroughs, wrinkling her nose and striding intentionally away. What's the matter with them? Harvey sh shrugged. Don't take it too hard, Burroughs screamed. Their ancestors are directly descended from the Mayflower passengers. But I want to know what the art but I want to know what the artist is trying to say. You don't ask something like that. It's indecent. Why? Would you ask God? what he wanted to express with his creation. Didn't I tell you, art is the new religion and the supreme commandment of all religions is to believe, not to understand. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Are you uh, willing to answer some questions if people have questions? <laughs> I have several, so if I get long-winded, you can cut me off. Uh, my first question is, do we know what happened to the brain after Thomas Harvey passed? Uh, I guess he, he gave it back to the hospital of Princeton. Uh, but really, what they, they're, they're done with it, I don't know. But, in, but it went back. Yeah, okay. he gave it. So they knew he had it then. I they, guess. They, they knew it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people knew it. But uh, Harvey changed his living place very often. He he had a, lived in a lot of times in new uh, towns in New Jersey. Then 
He's, he's gone to the Midwest. Uh, he lived in Wichita and in Weston and last year in Lawrence, uh, but never thought that he could work in a plastic factory. And But sometimes uh, journalists came and tried to, to interview him, but she didn't say too much. <laughs> um, do you know if he did any like research with the brain? Like when he had it, did he investigate anything about it or he just had it? Uh, yeah, he, he, he cut it. He, first he made photos, then he, he had to cut it. Uh, so before he, he, he let, let it paint from a painter. Uh, oh. Then he, he cut it to, to cubes. Uh, yeah, about 200 cubes. 200 cubes. <laughs> did he, what did he, did he write anything about what he found? Or? No, no, he, he, he didn't write anything. Uh, but he, he made uh, from these cubes small plastifications and gave these plastifications to a lot of uh, neurologists, professors. Oh. and. But they, they didn't also found too much. There was one, I guess, a Canadian professor who found that there is a, a kind of, of lime, a more and more type of, of this Q, Q maybe, uh, in this brain, like in, in, in other brains. But the, the, the other brains she had were from, from crime. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll let someone else ask. So, have you had a chance to see the apartment that he lived in? I live in that building. <laughs> you live in the building. And in fact, I can send you photos of inside the apartment. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so maybe uh, we can share. Emails yeah, I was I was outside the building today. Uh, yeah. And yeah. You mean this Viking town or? Something? Yeah, yeah, I live in yeah. Viking. Yeah, yeah. And the, the apartment was was open. Okay. Ah. Um, and available. I can't afford to it together. Yeah. But mm -hmm. my, my partner, Tom Shook is an actor who plays Einstein and has written a play about Einstein. Okay. And when I came to look for an apartment, I, I liked the apartment building. Yeah. And the landlady just said, I can't. Oh, by the way, it's oh. living. <laughs> Einstein. No. So I can send you photos of the oh, interior. Yeah, great. Yeah. I, I think uh, how he was um, had a visitor from Japan. It's on the YouTube, uh, Professor Sugimoto is his name. And it, it's a, a, f a film from a, from a Scandinavian filmmaker. And maybe, I, I guess it should be in this apartment. This, <laughs> this, oh, cool. Yeah. Well, let's, let's the, the, the Japanese was, was complete enthusiastic. And, <laughs> and at, at least, he asked, can I see the brain? Yeah. Of course, you can see the brain. And, and then he, he gave him a small piece of the brain. Wow. Yeah, he, he put it out with his fingers and <laughs> <laughs> fetched a, a kitchen you. knife <laughs> and on, <laughs> on the wood. He, he cut off a piece and, and the Japanese was enthusiastic. And, and gone with this brain, I don't know, maybe in Kansas City to a... How you call it when you when you are singing in, in front of an audience at the karaoke in, in the karaoke yeah. bar, and he told the audience that he has this brain and yeah. sing, sing a, a Japanese song. That <laughs> <laughs> was uh, very strange. Well, I understood from you know uh, seeing the reenactments and hearing the story. It seems like his finest hour was in convincing the family not to have the brain returned because Einstein absolutely did not wish this to happen to him. He was very worried that people would go ahead and remove his brain and the family was livid when they heard that he had taken the brain out. So I guess he gave some sort of an impassioned appeal to them saying that you know what might be lost that he'd already taken the brain out, no putting it back. And the family was convinced from his argument to allow him to keep the brain. That they could have gone ahead and had the police literally take the brain away from him, you know, at that moment and cremate it with the body. But uh, 
because a number of people after the autopsy, needless to say, noticed that <laughs> they had taken the brain. <laughs> but is there any insight on what he told them? And, you know, was there no kind of follow up for the family <laughs> wanted to know if anything happened with this research? Because uh, yeah, the family actually had two sons. Uh, one son was in, in Switzerland. He, had a, a, he was a little bit schizophrenic. He was in a, in a special place. And the other son was in Florida. Uh, he's an architect. He, he built bridges. And he wanted the brain back, but the thing was that they buried Einstein's body very, very quickly after he died on the same day. He died around midnight and at four in the afternoon he buried his body. And after this, they, they noticed that the brain is not in bed, gun bed in the, in the head. And then they didn't know well, when we get the brain back, uh, what, what should we do with it? Should we burn it solo? <laughs> or, or should we make a grave of it? Uh, and uh, Harvey promises that he, he only makes for works for science, not not um, for a, for a general press. And so they said, okay, you, you can try to to make some research for first for for some months, and and then they forgot maybe, and, and then they wanted to back, and and there was a lot of discussion with him. He, he went uh, to, to, to Manhattan, to this automaton, was, the, was one of the executors of the testamentary. And they had a lot of discussion, but at the end, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't give it back. Yeah. So will you be, in your book, will you be dealing with Einstein's approach to religion? Because it's... I, I've always thought it was very interesting that Einstein's body was cremated because that goes against Jewish re religious tradition. Um, and so I, I think it's very interesting that Einstein appears to be culturally and socially Jewish, but not religiously Jewish. Yeah. So are you thinking about including that, or is it just going to be Harvey's journey? Uh, I, I think... It's more Einstein's journey. Or oh, how we how we tries to to bring this this physics uh, religion, and so he tries a lot of possibilities, but it never worked really. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, at the, at the end, you will not know is it really the brain who who spoke or is it the, mm -hmm. the mind of Harvey who spoke mm -hmm. with him. So. Do we have anyone in the audience that knew Thomas Harvey? Oh. A few people? Yeah. Uh, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was the prison doctor up at uh, Kansas State Penitentiary. Yeah, in Lehman Brothers. And yes, he was the prison doctor. And that was when he was living in Weston. Yeah, yeah. And he commuted back and forth, had a private practice then shortly after that, that he lost his medical license. Yeah. I think he left left employment of the prison in 86, maybe, 85, 86. Oh. And it was 88 that his uh, medical license was taken away from him. Do you him. know why? I think it's somebody else's brain. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Einstein. Yeah. Not real, but he no, he, he, his uh, competency was called into question, as I remember correctly. His competency was called into question. Yeah, yeah. And he was examined yeah. by the uh, Board of Healing Arts, and his license was withdrawn. Mm. At thought, that point, I thought he was a problem. Well, he was a pathologist, but he was also a medical doctor. Sure. And uh, at that point in time, it kind of if hiring a doctor in prison is a relatively difficult thing to do. It's it doesn't pay very well, and obviously, at that point in the late seventies, early eighties, 
Lansing was not exactly the nicest correctional facility in the world. And so it was difficult for them to hire and they took it. They, they took, they hired who they could is what it boiled down to. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, do you know where he had his uh, his examination, he did the tests for? Um, I'm not sure. I think it was I think Wichita, but I'm not sure. Okay. Hmm. I, because I, I found he was at that point he would he had to have been certified. To yeah. be practicing both in the state of Kansas and in the state of Missouri. Yeah, he, yeah. He had a private practice up in Weston. Yeah, you, you know him in this in this time? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I knew him. He, yeah. he uh, I, I worked at I worked at the prison. Oh, you worked at the prison? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yes, I, I worked at, at Lansing. And, oh, I was Lansing, not leaving I, I this. No, it's yeah. Lansing. Lansing. There's well, it's the work Yeah, they're they're <laughs> different <laughs> sides of town. Yeah. Uh, Lansing is run by the state of Kansas. Yeah. Uh, Leavenworth is uh, United Federal. States prison. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I worked inside in in the inside cell houses right across from the clinic. Yeah. Okay. And had quite a bit of contact with him. Yeah. And he came. Once per week or so. No, he, he it was more often than that. Often. Although he did have a reputation. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it, he was aging by that point. And, okay. And you know, people get have a sick day or need to do something else might be off. Oh, yeah. But it was it was a regular job for him. Okay. I, I knew him too. Um, I met him at the Orient Friends Meeting, Society of Friends Meeting. Yeah, I am. And this was in the early 90s. And uh, I'm a photographer, and at one point he wanted to have some photographs made of himself because he said he was getting requests of uh, pictures of himself. I didn't really know why at the time. Yeah. Um, so I went to his apartment at the Viking. <laughs> I went into the apartment with my camera and I, I took some pictures of him and uh, started, you know, started asking him about the brain. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he, he said, he said, come on. And we walked into his bedroom, which was a really cluttered bedroom. And he opened up his closet and up on a shelf in the closet were these two gallon jars yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he got them down and he just handed it to me <laughs> so I, I, I held the brain <laughs> did you feel smarter like <laughs> holding it i was just kind of stunned by the whole yeah. but, uh, you know it was just really you know a jar in a viking town of really? <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> it's so weird i'm going to talk to you after <laughs> well, no, no. The, by that time, the brain was sectioned for study, yeah. so the jars just had, you know, pieces. pieces. Yeah. And you said that was in the 70s or 80s? Well, I, when I took the pictures, it was the winter of 95, 96. So they were just starting the ability to do MRIs and things like that? I, yeah, I mean, he, he told me that he had, had, just as you said, he had distributed samples to researchers. Yeah. One in Canada that you mentioned, and there was yeah. somebody in uh, uh, Berkeley, California as well, yeah. that I knew about. But there were, I think there were plenty of others. Yeah. Huh. Were the jars labeled? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know there was, I mean, the, <laughs> there were some markings. Yeah, there were some markings. And I was started on Harvey, uh, and this is probably no relations, but Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, mm -hmm. right? And one was about this brain, and I believe it ended with 
and Einstein's brain is now in an ice chest in Wichita, Kansas at that time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it must have been in the, in the 80s. That was a radio. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this, he would make up, not make up, he would tell stories in a very interesting way yes. and tell them the rest of the story. Yeah. Ah, and you think it's in Wichita now? No, that no, was in the 80s. Yeah, 80s or 90s. Yeah. So, thank you, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm curious about your process and how you came to being curious about this in the first place and then how the stages of development of your storyline. Uh, yeah, first I'm collecting facts. Uh, and then I, uh, I, I try to 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 write near the the reality, the the, the facts I found. Uh, but then I, there's also a, a second level with fiction. Uh, so the, the the book story with the Jewish is fiction. Harvey uh, goes when the brain started to speak. He goes to a psychoanalyst. It's all also <laughs> fiction, and, and, and a lot of this stuff. Uh, but the, the, the main dates are, I, I try that they are really correct. And so it's also important for me to to see Lawrence and to see the apartment and and to to write it as true as, true as possible. And so it's. Yeah, it's growing. A story is growing. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I'm, my, my books are around five, six hundred pages. They're not too small and, uh, because I'm. It's like a for me like a second world, world like a, a computer playing. Maybe I'm I'm diving into a story and I I'm living in the reality, but I, I live also in the story. And sometimes I, I'm dreaming about the story and I, I notice some things and I know okay. This is uh, part of the story. And then comes a moment I, I even don't know, is it reality or is it my fiction? So I was, before I came here, I was in Manhattan and this uh, executor of Einstein's brain lived in Manhattan, that's for sure. And in my story, he lived in the, in the 10th street. I'm not sure lives he in reality in the 10th street or is it only my story uh, and i in my in austria new york manhattan i saw the skyscrapers and uh this green marquees and uniform uniform householders or uh, stuff like that and then i came to the 10th street and it's a you know, like screenage and the houses are maybe have five floors are not no skyscrapers they're very common like like uh, Chemnitz or Münster in Germany, <laughs> very small, <laughs> small town like, and and so I have to change this part of the text, and so, yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to do. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. It's a